Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. As the Lord often does, he providentially sets up the sermon very well with the context of the testimony, and so keep a lot of those marriage and father images in mind. And so if you've seen in your bulletins, uh, we are coming to the conclusion of our Proverbs series, and uh, this one is entitled The Excellent Wife, Part 1. Next week, for those of you who are really good at math, will be Part 2. Um, this is a timely topic in our upside-down world because we live in a world where many people can't even define what a woman is. Uh, marriage is meaningless, and uh, they even will replace the term mother with birthing person. Yes, this is the crazy world that we live in. And if you're struggling with any of these, see me after class. Um, and if you're still struggling with any of these, ask any Christ-following female in here what a woman is, and she will gladly tell you. Uh, that's about as far as I'm going to get into the foolishness, uh, but with all seriousness, Dealing with Proverbs 31 is one of the reasons uh, that it's so beloved is how beautiful godly femininity is and how God is uniquely glorified in mature womanhood. And so we're going to look at a lot of that beauty here. But there's also a danger in this, as my wife reminded me this week, uh, that women, I think a, a, a struggle for women is comparison. Uh, comparing themselves to other women uh, often comparing themselves to the Proverbs 31 woman, seeing this excellent wife as a requisite or a necessity for being a Christian woman. And this temptation here to compare yourself as women to this excellent woman and then fall short is that you're going to fall short. And you're going to be devastated if you think that if I'm not all these things, I'm not a Christian. And I know that many women have struggled with this. So hopefully, this sermon will be an encouragement in both of those. The beauty of godly femininity, but also the reality of what is being taught here in Proverbs 31. Because we're going to look at Proverbs 31, especially the last 21 verses of the excellent wife, as they're intended to be. It's a poem. And it's a godly ideal, and it uh, personifies wisdom in a more clear way than, or a more direct way than we've seen in the rest of the book. So week one, uh, this week we're going to do an overview of womanhood and marriage in Proverbs uh, and then just give you the 30,000 foot view of Proverbs 31. Next week, we're going to go more in depth verse by verse through Proverbs 31 uh, and there are detailed exegesis. So let's pray and then we will begin. Lord, we praise you this morning. It's all the songs we sang earlier. Glory be to our great God. All of our praises could not contain the glory of your name. Lord, we could sing from now until Christ returns, and we would still never give you the due honor and glory that you deserve. May everything we say and do here this morning build up your church. May your saints find encouragement in Christ. May we celebrate how you've created us as male and female. May everything we do here this morning glorify the name of Christ. And we go forth from this room confident in our salvation, encouraged in the gospel, loving your word because it feeds us and edifies us. And it points us to the person and work of your son. May your spirit guide my words this morning. May your spirit prepare the hearts and ears of the hearers this morning, that this would be a spiritual conversation between those who are spiritual, that we would be reminded of your word, that, that we would be people formed in your image for your glory, because you are our God and we are your people. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So before we get into the climactic conclusion of the entire book uh, in chapter 31, it's important to recap how we've got here. If you've been here for a while, we've gone through much in the first nine chapters dealing with each poem uh, more exegetically, and then in chapters 10 through 30, thematically dealing with wealth and uh, anger and friendship and the, the, the two paths, righteousness and wickedness, wisdom and folly, uh, many other things we, we dealt with. 
But what I want you to see from beginning to end, Proverbs begins with and ends with wise femininity or divine femininity. It begins with the call of wisdom. So go all the way back to chapter 1. We read this earlier in our intercessory prayer. If you're new to the church, we gather every week at 930 to pray together. But I use this as an encouragement and a challenge. And so I want to start uh, that way. This is back, I think we began in November. Lady Wisdom, wisdom itself, God's divine wisdom is personified in chapter 1. She begins her cry in verse 20. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. The world has so many competing voices. The world has many megaphones. And wisdom herself cries out, and those who have ears to hear listen. She's at the entrance of the city gates, and she speaks. Verse 22, how long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn or repent at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you because, uh, because I have called and you refuse to listen. I have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, don't be surprised if you listen to the calls of the world and your life is a mess. Then, verse 28, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and they did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have nothing to do with my counsel, and they despise my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way, and they will have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. As godly parents give instruction to young men, this is the counsel. Listen to Lady Wisdom. And the contrast begins to develop between wisdom and folly over the first nine chapters. So we're going to fast forward to chapter nine. Here's where wisdom, Lady Wisdom finds her counterpart, Lady Folly. They both give a speech. They both give an evangelistic appeal. They both call you in to feast and to fellowship with them. Listen to the differences between these two women. women. Chapter nine, verse one. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn it with seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. Notice how industrious she is. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in town. Here's her call. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. You've got the wicked and the fool. The simple has not made their, their mind up yet, but the simple is by default the fool. And simple is faced with a choice. Will you listen to Lady Wisdom or Lady Folly? Lady Wisdom goes on, to him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine that I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. We've shown Proverbs as these two paths. There's the way to life, this path, as Jesus called the narrow way, that leads to life everlasting. And then there's another way. There's another path. It's a wide and easy way that leads to destruction. Here is the call of that woman in verse 13. The woman folly is loud. She's seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. Notice she's lazy. She's not industrious like Lady Wisdom. She takes a seat in the highest places in town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Lady folly loves those on the straight way to pull them over to the dark side. Whoever is simple, let them turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Lady Wisdom has wine that she's mixed, bread that she's baked. Lady Folly just steals and distorts what God has made. It goes on, but he does not know that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Two paths, one of life, one of death. And the parents set before these young sons, which one will you choose? Reading this, the answer is obvious, but it's not as easy to tell when we walk out into the world. 
And we'll see more of that. And in this, Proverbs practically mirrors the Christian life. Sons and daughters following Christ on the way, avoiding sin, living to righteousness. And Christ, as Lady Wisdom, calls his people. The gospel call goes out. He exemplifies the good husband. So this morning, before we get into chapter 31, there's a few verses we have not looked at yet. I specifically left the verses on women and marriage until the end. And so we're going to look at those in three categories. Three steps for young bachelors. And these three steps point us to the Christian walk. Step number one, first importance, avoid the seductive, sinful woman. Step number one, avoid path number one. Admittedly, this is difficult for young men, as it is for old men. This is the continuous struggle for the rest of our lives, men. We are drawn in by what is flashy, by what is seductive, by what is appealing on the surface. And every one of us knows the trappings of giving in to the, the promise of short, immediate pleasure, but lasting pain. Step number one, avoid that. Because there is a world that is seductive to a man. There are seductive women out there. But the greater lesson to all of us is avoiding the seduction of the world. Because the world employs the same tactics as prostitutes do. Come in here. All it takes is just a little bit of your money, a little bit of your time, and I will give you what you desire. And you'll feel better, and you'll walk away, and everything will be right. But that's a lie, and it can never do that. Just like wisdom is personified, so is seduction. Lady folly, the foolish women, the, the foolish woman. So one of the things I want you to see here is the power and influence that femininity has. So women, if you're married in here, our wives have the ability to build us up. And to encourage us and to make us stand strong. Women have the ability to tear us down and lead us astray. We see this in a culture where sex sells. You want to push your, your, your product, put a half naked woman on it. And men will fork over their money. There are many billion dollar industries built on this that are not pornography. This is what our world does. This is the appeal, and it's nothing new. It's what we saw in Proverbs 3,000 years ago. I think also to this power that women wield. It may not be the power of kings and nations, but it is the power over the heart of man. I think this is why a lot of powerless men, men want to become women. Because maybe, maybe there. I can have influence. Maybe there I can find importance. So some of these texts that we haven't looked at, they, they, they vary from extreme. If you go to Proverbs 23, I mean, this one is literal. This is easy. Should not require much explanation. Proverbs 23, beginning in verse 26. If you read the rest of this chapter, this is the parents. My son, give me your heart. Listen to me. Don't give over your affections. Let your eyes observe my ways. Don't let your eyes wander. Because if I have your heart, if you listen to your wise parents, you won't fall in with the prostitute. But the prostitute, she's a deep pit. An adulteress is a narrow well. Deep pit, you can't get out of it. Narrow well, you can't get out of it. Don't fall in there. She, the prostitute, the adulteress, the seductive world lies in wait like a robber and increases the traitors among mankind. This is what our enemy does. He is set out like a robber. He cannot make anything. He cannot build anything. He can only tear down and destroy. But those who walk lonely at night, unguarded, are the ones who are most susceptible to the robbers. So that's obvious. Avoid the prostitute. Absolutely. Absolutely. But then there's some warnings that are a little more subtle. Look at, go back to chapter 11, verse 22. And 
I don't think most of us have problems with that verse in chapter 23, but all of us have problems with this verse in chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 22. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. Beauty is deceiving. There's an old saying that says, not all that glitters is gold. Don't base your affections, don't make your choices on external appearances. We are visual, superficial creatures. We like shiny things, but remember, we looked at this earlier in Proverbs, fishing lures are shiny things. And when fish go after those fishing lures, they find themselves as someone else's dinner. This is what happens when you get drawn in by the, the uh, gold ring. Only focusing on appearance is like being mesmerized by the gold and missing the pig. This is such a beautiful picture of sin in the world. At first glance, it is pleasing to the eye. Look at the gold. Look how it glimmers in the sun. It's this little ring, but this massive, disgusting, dirty hog we miss because we get pulled in by the fleeting desires of the shiny things. This is the world. It dangles the little lure in front of us, hiding from our eyes the ugliness and the dirtiness of sin. If you get this step, this all-important step number one, you will save yourself a lot of headache and a lot of misery. And here's how it relates to the Christian walk. Step number one, mortification. If you're here and you don't know what that word means, it just means put to death. Kill it. Die to yourself. Die to the old man. Jesus came because we're ugly, wretched sinners, dead in our trespasses and sins, walking in death, believing in death, dealing in death. Die to that. Put that to death. Avoid the seductive woman. Step number one, repent and believe because the kingdom of God is at hand. This mirrors the Christian walk because if you avoid that seductive woman, if you avoid the, the trappings of the world and getting pulled in by your own desires, it makes walking on the narrow path much easier. While the things of this world are appealing, they are in fact disgusting in the eyes of God, and we should mortify or put them to death. That is step number one. Step number two. So, step number one, avoid the seductive woman. Step number two, find a good wife. Essentially, make right choices. Uh, let's look at chapter 12, verse 4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. So this term here, excellent wife, I want you to remember. Uh, in the Hebrew, this is eshet chayel, which is a woman of strength, a woman of ability, a woman of nobility. A woman of excellence. This is the same phrase that appears at the beginning of Proverbs 31. This is the same phrase that is applied to Ruth. It'll be up on the screen. Look at Ruth 3.11. Where Ruth does the noble thing. Boaz recognizes her commitment to her mother-in-law. Her humility before him. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are an eshet chayel, a worthy woman. This worthy woman is the crown of her husband, an excellent wife. This is the theme of Proverbs 31, this excellence. And she's contrasted with the shameful wife. Because if you have the excellent wife, the direction of your life will be glory and honor, a crown. She is, she is regal. She is commendable. She is desirable. But if you don't find this woman of strength, this woman of valor, and this applies generally as well in our decisions, if you don't choose what is, what is honorable and what is strong and commendable, but you choose what is shameful, it will be like rottenness to your bones. This is the same language that we saw to describe envy a couple weeks ago. This rottenness in your bones, it's, it's deep down hurt. It eats you from the inside out. 
And if, you've, if you're married to a shameful person, or you make these shameful mistakes, you, you align yourself, you unequally yoke yourself to what is miserable, you know the rot inside your bones. There is no heartache like being drawn into a shameful union. My son, avoid it. Seek the excellent wife, the excellent things. Here's the excellent wife, chapter 14, verse 1. Going back to chapter 1, wisdom builds her house. Here's the wisest of women builds her house. But folly with her own hands tears it down. It doesn't mean that a woman needs to be a carpenter. What does it mean to build a house? She orders her home. She establishes her family. She cares for, her need, for their needs. This is a wise woman. She orders her home. And we're going to unpack this next week in chapter 31. Notice the power here. The wise woman can build up a home, but the foolish woman can tear it down single-handedly. And that is all Lady Folly can do. That is all our enemy can do. To distort and tear down what God has set up. Let's move on. Chapter 18, verse 22. Very similar. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. This should bring our minds back to creation. This is creation imagery. It is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. It is not good that man should be alone. And so the good thing, not that God could do anything that was not good, but it was incomplete until man had a helper. One like him, a flesh of his flesh, a bone of his bone, taken from his side. I love Matthew Henry when he said that he didn't take her from Adam's head to be above her, or from Adam's feet to be below her, but from Adam's rib to be beside him. Excuse me, not above him, not, not below him, but beside him. This is the perfect picture of the compliment to man, an excellent woman. It's a good thing. This is God's design for all of humanity. Before sin, this is what God set out for his image bearers and for our flourishing. And this, it is from the Lord. And so as you seek your decisions, those of you who are young or seeking future spouses, how do you do that? Know that it comes from the Lord. Pray for it. Petition him for it and trust him for it. Because he is the God who provides. And we recognize his provision. And James reminds us that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. The Father of lights. The Lord of glory. If God designed it in his creation order, don't you think he knows what is best for it and can order it in your life? This is whether you're married or single. Because God is glorified in each. And marriage can be a wonderful blessing, but if not approached correctly or taken unequally yoked, it can be a weary, wearisome burden. Let's go to chapter 21, verse 9. This idea is so important, so heavy, it is, it is used three different times in Proverbs. 21, 9, it is better to live in the corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome woman. Verse 19 in the same chapter, it is better to live in a, de in a desert land than with a, with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. The same verse, 21, 9, is repeated in 25, 24. We don't need to go there. Better to live in the corner of your roof or in a desert than with a, with a quarrelsome woman. Um, all of those of us who are married, we understand that bickering Arguing, it is exhausting. It sucks all of the life out of the room. And if you are married to one of those people, it is a burden. It is exhausting. But men, if you have one of those wives, you have your hands full. But roll up your sleeve because she is your wife. And you love her as Christ loves you in all of your bickering, in all of your arguing, 
in all of your pettiness. Ladies, likewise, the reverse is also true. If you have one of these, these husbands who just berates you and who criticizes you, one, shame on him. I hope the Lord convicts him. But there's also a recipe for this, and I love the picture that Peter gives us in 1 Peter chapter 3. I mean, this is often quoted as it, as it should be. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Notice, conduct is mentioned twice. Even if your husband is a jerk, submit to him for the glory of God. But notice, most people don't pick up on this. This verse begins with likewise. So likewise tells us, oh, this must be something like something else that came before it. If you go to the end of chapter 2, this is sometimes why chapter divisions uh, mess up the, the flow of an idea. What is Peter appealing to? Jesus committed no sin. There was no deceit in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to God who judges justly. Men and women in difficult marriages, here is your example. Jesus committed no sin. He did not deserve the the, the suffering and the reviling that he received, but he entrusted his life to his father. And in the gospel example, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Here we go, the mortification, the vivification again. Christ suffered for us, for us, that we might die to sin, live to him. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. That's the context. He cared more for your soul than winning an argument. That is our role in marriage. We intercede for our spouses. We are patient with our spouses. We don't revile in return. Because we care for more for their souls, as Christ did for us. Let's move on. Back in Proverbs chapter 19. This is very similar. This is a theme here. If Proverbs, when Scripture speaks often, we should pay attention. A lot of you young people are thinking about marriage, moving toward marriage, or you are new in marriage. Take note of this, please. Chapter 19, verse 13. A foolish son is a ruin to his father, and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. Thumb over real quick to chapter 27 before we finish that that verse. This is so poignant that it's fleshed out even further in chapter 27, verse 15. Uh, I forgot to tell you, if you're here for the first time, we're glad you're here, but you will always need a Bible here. You hear all this page flipping? The angels are rejoicing. Um... Proverbs 27, 15, a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. To restrain her is to restrain the wind or to grasp oil in one's right hand. It is exhausting to be in a quarrelsome marriage. Women, you have the power to make our days sunny and bright or rainy and miserable. That is great power that you hold over our hearts. Foolish sons, they make foolish choices. They choose the seductive woman. They choose the the fleeting pleasure. But a prudent wife, one who is not the quarreling, contentious type, she's from the Lord. She's a good thing. She's a good gift. That we, we praise God for. We also need to apply the reverse. Man, if you are married in here, or if you desire to be married, do we think about how we build up our wives? Do we nourish and cherish them as we read earlier in Ephesians? Or are we the quarrelsome type? Are we the one who is like the dripping faucet? Are we the ones who exhaust our wives because of our heavy hands?
So here's the second parallel. So step two, find a good wife. The second parallel to the Christian life, vivification. To revive something, bring it back to life. Think of that. Vivification, believe that Christ is enough. Choose him above all else. Choose what is noble. Choose what is excellent. Choose what is good, not what is shameful and what is fleeting. And importantly, in that, and I think this is hard for people, a lot of people have a hard time with this, love his bride. That's us. That's the church. We are the quarrelsome, petty bride that is not easy to live with. Many of you, many people calling themselves Christians would rather live out in the desert than live with the church. Make a church of their own making, in the corner of their own homes because they can't face being hurt. But as I say often, if Christ died for this unloving bride, how could we not love her? If Christ laid down his life as the example in marriage for us, a quarrelsome, petty, selfish bride. How could we not? So men, we're going to deal with sanctification today in our men's study. And if you're here, I hope you, we've got plenty of food, Lord willing. And, um, and we're going to deal with sanctification. We're going to deal with mortification, putting our sins to death. We're going to deal with vivification, putting on Christ. This is what we are sanctified for, men, to be leaders, to be examples, to be peacemakers in our homes and in the church. And we're going to flesh that out later this afternoon. So, step number three. For young bachelors, when you find a good wife, devote yourself to her. Let's go back to chapter five. Chapter five, the first two-thirds are avoid the sinful woman. We already went there. The seductive woman. But the latter half of chapter five, beginning in verse 15, is what happens when you find a good wife. You find an excellent wife. Here is what Solomon extols us with. Verse 15 of chapter five, drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, there's a lot of imagery here. If you're curious, go back to the previous messages. I won't get into it this morning. Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders, the Lord ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Devote yourself to your wife. Proverbs 27, verse 8, illustrates this. There's only one that's, that's needed here, and then we'll jump into chapter 31. Proverbs 27, verse 8. Very simple, very poignant. Like a bird that strays from its nest is a man who strays from his home. As we saw in chapter 5, femininity is beautiful. It's enticing to a man. And we should desire that in our wives. The problem is we're sinners with eyes. And whether it's in person or online, our eyes are so easily led astray. And where our eyes go, there our heart goes. But really, our eyes go because our heart is already gone. And it is as foolish for us to be led astray by the seductive woman, by the seduction of the world, as it is for a bird to leave its nest. What does a bird have in its nest? It has home. It has food. It has shelter. It has safety. What's outside of the nest? Predators. I have a backyard with a lot of trees And one of the things I love to do is watch the hawks. Because when a squirrel gets a little too comfortable on the power line or on the edge of the fence, or bird gets too far from the nest, 
you hear the screech of the hawk and then screeches of the other hawks and they eat good every time one leaves the nest. What a picture of the world. So we don't need to stretch this too far. I mean, this certainly applies within marriage, 100%. You have, who builds a home and then goes and sleeps somewhere else? Who builds a home and then goes lays in a cave? Who builds a home and goes and lives in the wilderness? Christ has given us a home. How often do we stray? How often do we go after the fleeting promises of what's outside of the nest? Not believing the promises, the realities of what our Savior has given us. How often do we run from our security? How often do we run from our provider? We're adulterous people. We are drawn after the desires of our heart. So step number three, devote yourself to your wife, to the young bachelor, but to the Christian, devote yourself to your husband. Devote yourself to Christ Jesus. Let's recap. Avoid the sinful woman. Find the, a good wife, the good thing. Put to death the old man. Put, to, put on the new man. And once you are the new man, once you've found the one who you've been betrothed to, devote yourself to them. We have been called in holiness to be set apart for him. He says, I, have go, I am going to make a place for you. I am preparing a home. I'll be back. Don't stray from the nest. Now we are ready to read chapter 31. Chapter 31, we're going to read the whole thing, spend a little bit of time on the introduction, and give you some broad strokes on the woman in verses 10 and following. The words of King Lemuel, Proverbs 31, verse 1, an oracle that his mother taught him. What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, the son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what, they have, what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to the one who is perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. We'll read the rest in just a moment. Uh, number one, we don't know who Lemuel is. The best guess we have is that he is a foreign king who converted to Judaism and who aligned himself with the true and living God and apparently had a wise mother. Either way, this notice that chapter 31 begins with counsel from a wise woman, a wise mother. The rest of the book has counsel from father and mother, but mostly father. This final chapter, this culmination, is a wise woman exemplifying a wise woman and, and setting all of this up. And she wants her son to learn. She, so she teaches him this. This Hebrew word means to communicate knowledge in order to shape specific conduct. This is not just know these things in the corner of your head. This is know them so that you rule this way, so that you lead this way. And there's, there's, there's two things, self-control and compassion. This is what she asks for in this ruler. Now, we don't know if um, Lemuel wrote this and the end. It doesn't matter, but it sets it up very well. So this is advice from a good wife, a wise mother, to know yourself, verses 2 through 5, and know your, know your people. Self-control and be compassionate. But I want you to get something here that we miss in the English, unfortunately. Look right at the beginning of know yourself. When she says, what are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? First thing she warns, do not give your strength to women. And we want to guess what that strength word is in Hebrew. Chayol. Excellence. Do not give your excellence, your strength, your ability to women, plural. Same word that is used in chapter 10 for excellent wife. Excuse me, verse 10. Same word 
that is used in verse 29. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. The temptation of women is like that of alcohol. It is intoxicating. It takes your strength. So the, so the, count, the first counsel of this wise mother to a wise king, don't give your excellence to women. Look for the excellent woman. Don't settle for many women who may take your strength. Long ago, Hall and Oates remind us to look out for the man-eater, because she's, cause, cause she's coming. Look for one good woman. Some of you will explain that later. Hence, some of you are going to be humming that on the way home. Hopefully you remember more than that. Hence, verse 10 through 31. An eshet chayel, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with her willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She ri rises while it is yet night and provides food for her, husband, for her household and provides for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff. Her, her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all of her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates, and when he sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of your hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So how should we read Proverbs 31? And I encourage you to read Proverbs 31 this week. And again, we'll get into it in more details next week. Here's something you may not know. This is a Hebrew acrostic. Now, you may not know what an acrostic is, but an acrostic is kind of like an acronym, but more intentional. Each letter of each line begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Some of you are taking Hebrew right now. From Aleph, Bet, Gimel, He, all the way down to Tov, each line begins with a, Hebrew alpha, a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. If we were to read this in English, we would see clearly this is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way down each line. This is a poem with extreme intentionality. These are the ABCs of wisdom personified. This is laid out to be an example to God's people for all time. There's not really a chronological progression, but there is a poetical structure. It begins and ends with praise. There is an intro about how worthy she is to her husband in verses 10 to 12. The body is her work to her family, in verses 13 through 19, and her work in her community, verses uh, 19 through 27. And there's a conclusion. It begins with her worth to her husband, but then it concludes with her worth that is given to her from her children, from her husband, and from everyone. This noble woman begins in nobility in her home, builds up her home first. Then the nobility goes out into her community, and her family and her community praise her for her value. This is a beautiful poem. It's similar to Psalm 112. If you turn one book in the past, I want you to see Psalm 112 is a very similar genre. These are often called hero hymns. 
Notice all the similarities. This is a good exercise this week. Read Proverbs 31, read Psalm 112, and compare the imagery. In Proverbs 31, the excellent wife is praised. Not praised as in worship, but held up. In Psalm 112, the man who fears the Lord is praised. Not worship, but lifted up. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. This is Psalm 112, verse 1. Who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious and merciful and righteous. It is well with the man who dwells generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady, and he will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes in teeth and melts away, and the desire of the wicked will perish. Very similar idea of the one who fears the Lord, the man and the woman here. So this is to be read, Psalm 31 is to be read with the very best of wisdom, extolled or encouraged in feminine form. And so next week, we're going to look at each one of these verses, hopefully we can get it all in, um, and how we see all of these principles in Proverbs. Each one of these things are, that, that, that we've seen throughout going through the book of Proverbs is now seen in this, this ideal wise woman. This divine wisdom personified. And this is also a polemic. So it's an argument against Lady Folly because she's everything Lady Wisdom is not. She is lazy. She is selfish. She is superficial. She is not diligent. This is the final climax of the entire book. Son, I've been laying this out all along. This is the wise woman. This is the path that you should be on. But I think the problem here, going back to one of my initial comments about comparison, many women's ministries rightly intended set this up as the uh, standard for what a Christian woman must be. And it's read not as poetry, but as imperative. I think often Proverbs 31 is read as we read 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3 says what an elder must be. An elder must be above reproach. He must be the husband of one wife. He must be hospitable. He must be able to teach. And if we read poetry, like we read in instruction, we can often be burdened with the imagery. I think this is less what a woman must be but rather a noble example to all of divine wisdom. Think, see the beauty of wisdom? This wisdom I've been teaching you to get, she's like an excellent wife, the most excellent wife. This is lady wisdom. We read this similarly to how we read Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8, we looked at earlier. You can flip back there. Where we see Wisdom personified. And how wisdom points us to the one who encompasses all wisdom. Points us to Christ. We read this similarly to Proverbs 8. I'm going to begin in verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance in the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness and the path of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries." The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his act of old. Ages ago I was set up at the beginning before the foundation of the earth. When there was no depth, I was brought forth. There were no springs abounding in water. Before the mountains, before the hills, before the earth. When he established heavens, when, 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 when. 
and I was beside him, all the way down to verse 30, like a master workman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of men. This picture of God in his wisdom delighting in, in his creation. And then the, the, the industry of this wisdom being worked out in Proverbs 31. Just like he's not a woman, he's not a wife, but he is all wisdom. He is all perfections. And so when we see this human ideal, we praise him. We see him. So going back to Proverbs 31, what is an excellent wife? We'll spend more time on this next week, but I'll leave you um, with, with this for Proverbs 31. Verse 30, what is an excellent wife? One who is spiritually beautiful. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. This goes back to the thesis of the entire book. Chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is a being of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. From beginning to end, it is the fear of the Lord. This is what the parents are encouraging these sons for. So, ladies, are you to, are you to strive to be her? Yes. Can you be her? No. Whew. Big sigh of relief. Men, she has much to teach us as well. I love Bruce Waltke's thought here. I'll be up on the screen. He says, in conclusion, this valiant wife has been canonized or put into Scripture as a role model for all Israel for all time. Wise daughters aspire to be like her. Wise men seek to marry her. And all wise people aim to, in, to incarnate the wisdom she embodies, each in his own sphere of activity. One should avoid emphasizing one of these applications at the expense of another, forgetting that by nature, proverbial material sets forth exemplars, asking the audiences to make appropriate application to their own spheres. Hopefully that's helpful. If you don't know what he's saying there, uh, basically, yes, this is an example. But in this poetry, it's an example that we all strive toward, that we all learn from, and we apply it to our lives in different ways, and we'll, we'll get there next week. So coming full circle, here's, a wanna, here's how I want to finish off. Let's bring everything we've talked about so far together. Church, this morning, if you are here and you are in Christ, you are a saint. Be the excellent wife. Strive to be the excellent wife because Christ, our maker, is our husband. And if you're here for the first time and you think Christians are weird because we're talking about these, the, these things, it may sound a little bit weird at first, but it is beautiful. We read from Ephesians 5 earlier. This mystery of Christ in the church, the perfect husband, the one who gave the example of what it means to be a husband, to be a man who lays down his life for those he loves so that they would be beautiful and spotless so that he might present her for himself. That is our husband. If you are in Christ, the God of the universe took on flesh and laid down his life for you. He took it up again that you might have new life in him. And this picture of marriage is being made spotless. All of us in our dirty sinfulness like that pig are given white wedding gowns. And we are invited in to be united forever to the Son of God, the Son of Man. We are called to be his bride. We all should strive to be his excellent wife. And we do this in three easy steps. <laughs> Mortification, put your sin to death. Leave the old man behind. Stop worshiping and following after the seductions of this world. They only lead to death. Step two, vivification. Find Christ to be excellent. Live for him. Choose him above all. He is your husband. He will never leave and never forsake you. Number three, devote yourself to him. In holiness, like the woman in Proverbs 33, use all that he has given you and all that he has done for you for the praise of his name, exalt him, and at the end he will exalt you. And you will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. Your word is amazing. When we open it up, it unfolds layer after layer after layer of your plan of redemption, of your desire for mankind. You would create a people for yourself, man and woman. You would put them together and call them good. You would create marriage and all that comes with it so that we would see when Christ came that he embodies the husband and that we are prepared to be the bride. Lord, may you encourage the women in this congregation at the beauty of femininity. Don't let the world steal that from them. That they bring glory to you in their care and their concern and their diligence and their steadfastness and even in their silence. Lord, I pray for the men in this congregation when we look to Christ as our example. May we love our wives well. May we love the church well. Lay down our lives for your bride. May we all see Christ as most excellent, most worthy. All wisdom pointing to him. All submission laid down before him. That he might be glorified. May we live in such a way that we look forward to the day when we meet him face to face and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Here is my home that I've prepared for you. The nest I have given you, I will provide for all of your needs forever. I will be with you as your God and you as my people. Lord, we praise you that this is true and we can stake our lives on these promises. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.